Hello, everyone. My name is Shurja Sen. I am a program officer with the National Human Genome Research Institute. And I am very, very excited that you are here because uh, we have a funding opportunity that I am spectacularly excited to tell you about because we believe this will bring things to your students that uh, we have not been able to offer up to this point. Uh, so just a few procedural things before we get into the presentation. Um, this webinar will be a little bit of slides from me. I'll try to keep it to 10 or 12 minutes. Uh, hopefully that saves uh, lots of time for questions and answers. This is a webinar. Uh, the Q&A will happen through chat. Uh, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, Sarah Hutchison, who is uh, our program analyst, will call out those questions. We will make sure uh, every one of them gets answered. You do not have to identify yourself. Uh, anonymous submissions are allowed. We are not putting Zoom chat on for this webinar. That lets us focus on the questions that come in using the Q&A. Once we are done with the webinar, we will collect everything that got asked and together with questions from a previous webinar we did on the 1st of September, we will make a frequently asked questions page uh, that will then go on our website. Uh, and we will also be recording this and sharing a copy of that recording as well. So you, you'll have something to go back to later on. Um, I want to begin by pointing out that all of the funding announcements and relevant links are in the public space. Uh, on the top is the funding announcement for this webinar itself, which uh, I'm pretty certain all of you have seen. Extremely important, I want to call your attention to the second bullet, which is a notice uh, that we used to change a few things and make a couple of things more clear uh, about this funding announcement. But other than that, things like the associated U24 hub, uh, the FAQs that I mentioned, and things that are uh, strategic documents from the Genome Institute relevant to this funding opportunity are all listed on this slide. So this gives you somewhere to go back to if, uh, if you need any of these uh, for future reference. So let me get right into the content then. Uh, I will do a little bit of a background and purpose for what this work is about. Uh, and then tell you how we propose to fund you uh, to teach genomics and data science in your classrooms. Uh, I will cover a little bit of the application process. And then, as I said, hopefully save at least uh, three fourths of this hour for answering your questions. So I want to begin by telling you about the two parts of the Genome Institute or NAGRI that have joined forces uh, for this funding opportunity. I belong with the Office of Genomic Data Science, which is a part of NIGRI that funds anything and everything to do with the use of computational tools or mathematical or statistical tools in a genomics context. Uh, we have tons of funding, not just this opportunity, but things that are also research activities uh, as a distinct activity from teaching. So if you are anywhere in the space of genomic data science, I strongly recommend going to the link at the bottom of this page and checking out everything we have to offer because we have uh, multiple active research funding uh, opportunities that might be of interest to you. Together with the Office of Genomic Data Science, I am very excited that the Training, Diversity and Health Equity Office at uh, NHGRI, uh, which we acronymize as the TIDE Office, is our partner for the work that uh, I hope all of you will be uh, excited to apply for. The TIDE Office, as with OGDS, has a ton of things going on that aim to broaden and diversify the genomics, uh, genomics workforce, not just in data science, but genomics as a whole. So once again, just as with OGDS, if you are looking for things where you would bring more diverse students in, or you would bring more funding for teaching genomics at a minority serving institution, uh, I really think the TIDE office is a group of people that would be happy to talk to you and tell you more about what's happening over there. So quickly, our tool for all of the work that I propose uh, to fund through this is really based upon the fact that cloud computing in many ways is completely changing how genomic data science happens. Many of you uh, may be familiar with high performance computing and the fact that up to this point, institutions that teach data science and computing have historically been ones that had lots of money 
and were able to fund computing infrastructure on their campuses. This is no longer the case uh, with cloud computing. Pretty much anyone with a laptop and an internet connection now has access to all of the tools, all of the data, all of the compute resources that they would need, not just for their own learning, but also to teach their students uh, how data science and genomics are linked to each other. So really with NHGRI's Anvil platform, which you see a link or a screenshot on the left of the page, but also with many other cloud platforms that NIH has put billions of dollars into, such as the Biodata Catalyst, uh, the M M NCI Data Commons, the All of Us Researcher Workbench. Really at this point, NIH has a lot of money invested in cloud computing. And our hypothesis is that the cloud can also be a tool for teaching and for education as much as a tool for high performance computing and large scale science uh, in multi-million dollar consortia. So pretty much the context for all of this uh, webinar and everything we bring to you is to take cloud computing and put it in your hands as faculty members who teach genomics and hopefully we'll use the cloud to teach genomic data science. So the other aspect of this other than cloud computing is that NHGRI recognizes that uh, over the next 10 years, one of the highest priorities for us is broadening and diversifying the genomics workforce. On the left, you see a screenshot from the strategic vision document that we publish uh, about once every decade, where we say over the next 10 years, these are things that are important. Uh, you see there that uh, genomic data science is no longer something we feel could be optional for people that are trainees of the future. They will need to learn data science at the same time as genomics. And also on the right, what you see is our diversity action agenda, which is our plan for how to make genomics a more inclusive uh, scientific community over the next 10 years. And one of the things we are saying there is that particularly for data science, we need to start early. Undergraduates, master's degree students are the communities of interest, the specific populations that we want to engage uh, and make the genomics investigators of the future. So with that, uh, our way of tackling that problem of uh, a lack of diversity in genomics is through a combination of two funding announcements, uh, one of which has already been awarded, and I'll tell you more about that in a couple of slides. So at the center of the slide, you see uh, what we call the U24 educational hub for computational genomics and data science, that's uh, CGDS. So think of a group that is sort of the central community organizer. And I'll, I'll, as I said, I'll describe them in just the next couple of slides. But together with this central organizing entity, what we want to do is to fund individual faculty, like many of yourselves, to actually be partners of this hub, where the hub would help with organizing your material or organizing train the trainer workshops, but you would be the actual people going into classrooms, designing genomics education content and bringing the students into the picture. While the hub would help you do that, but you would get funds of your own to do that as a standalone activity within your institutions, uh, HBCUs, tribal colleges, community colleges, and institutions that enroll students from a wide variety of backgrounds. So that combination of a U24 hub and the UE5 partner sites, which uh, most of you have probably seen uh, and which brought you to this webinar, is our way of tackling the lack of uh, diversity in the current genomics workforce. So let me first quickly talk about the hub. As I mentioned, this is a large multi-million dollar award, uh, a U award, which is a cooperative agreement. NIH and the awardee together will act as a group of people who reach out to the different faculty members at different sorts of institutions, uh, offer genomics training material, workshops in cloud computing, workshops in computer programming, really do some of the early work that is more foundational and helps set the stage for everything that would come afterwards. Uh, I am happy to share that this award was just released a, a couple of weeks ago to North Carolina Agricultural and Technological University that is one of the nation's largest HBCUs. So really NCATSU, the awardee, at this point is already hitting the ground running in engaging faculty members like yourselves 
and I encourage you as well to reach out to them. Uh, information about how to contact them can be found either through this press release or you're very welcome to contact me and I'm happy to put you in touch with them. But remember, this is a group that has a large NIH award to help you teach genomics and data science in your classroom. So think of them as your partner in your educational missions. So together with the hub, of course, today, all of us are here to talk about the sites, uh, the UE5 funding announcement that probably brought you here. Our overarching purpose with the sites funding announcement is, as I said, to support faculty members like you at institutions which have a documented mission to enroll students from diverse backgrounds and help you be funded so that next semester or the semester afterwards, you are able to set a certain amount of time aside to say, I would like to build genomics courses that I can then teach to my students and also introduce them to the cloud. So really this is all about empowering faculty members at diverse institutions to be funded to develop and deliver genomics educational content. I will emphasize that the cloud is a big part of uh, what we are looking to do here. So as we get deeper into this, please remember that whatever we are funding will need to be exercised and shared using the cloud computing platforms that I referred to earlier in this presentation. So quickly, let me cover what the approach is uh, for this site's funding announcement. We are looking specifically at undergraduate and master's students that includes associate's degree students. So this does not have to be students in a four-year degree program. Uh, the content that we have in mind is, need, uh, is going to be a combination of classroom content together with hands-on exercises using cloud platforms as a virtual computer room of sorts, if you will. Uh, of course, Anvil and the other NIH clouds that I mentioned will be helping with this. You will not have to do this alone if you have never used the cloud before. Anvil and the other groups are here to help you learn about the cloud yourself as a way of introducing your students to it. Uh, we are also excited that the U24 hub that I uh, mentioned has money to offer six $50,000 grants to faculty members like you so that your students can design genomics research projects. So this is not just about students in a classroom learning genomics or students using the cloud as a virtual lab. There are six $50,000 awards for your students to actually get together with you and conduct a little project of their own. We believe that ha having them generate data will give them the organic ownership and excitement of why genomics could be a part of their future careers. Uh, there is a huge focus on sharing content. Uh, we want anything that you build uh, to be available to other institutions, other faculty members who did not get an award through this funding announcement. And once again, we expect the cloud to be a wonderful way of sharing everything that, uh, that is developed through this funding opportunity. Uh, NHGRI expects to partner with uh, quite a few other NIH institutes so that we can make a larger number of awards than our budget alone would permit. Okay, so since we published the funding announcement itself, I want to make sure that all of you get to see this accompanying notice. The notice number is on top and the link is in that slide at the beginning. We just wanted to clarify a few things that people asked a lot of questions about when we did the first webinar. And we are happy that we managed to extend the receipt date. So this was originally kept at October 8th, which would have been a very, very short amount of time for someone to write an NIH application. We are happy that we were able to extend that to November 8th. So you, between us publishing this and the first receipt date is over two months. That gives you more time to write your application. Many of you asked about whether your salary was an eligible cost. This notice is clarifying that you can put money in the budget to pay for your own salary and not just to develop and uh, teach things uh, while expecting your institution to cover your actual salary. There are some numbers in the funding announcement that give you a sense of the minimum commitment of how much time you have to devote to this and how much of your salary could be funded through this particular uh, funding announcement. But once again, you are able to do that, just so it's clear. And also, if you are teaching at a community college, 
I want you to know that you are very much in the scope of what we would like to see as applicants. In the initial funding announcement, we had sort of hinted at undergraduate and master's degrees, and it was pointed out that associate's degrees were not explicitly clarified as being eligible. So this is about students in community colleges getting two-year degree program degrees and does not have to be a four-year degree or a master's degree. So I hope that makes it clear that you are encouraged to apply as well. So let me talk a little bit about what would make an institution eligible for this funding announcement. This seems to be one of the topics that I have been responding to the most emails for. There are three conditions or three uh, criteria, all of which have to be met by your institution. So I, I want to use this slide to really explain how someone would or would not become eligible for applying and being funded through this funding announcement. So as I mentioned, we are looking to reach the smaller institutions that right now have not been able to include genomics and data science and cloud computing in their course offerings. So your, your college or your university has to have received less than $25 million per year of R01 funding. If you are a well-funded R01 institution with uh, many hundreds of millions of dollars of NIH funding, there are other things we have that are appropriate, but this particular funding announcement is not for the large, well-funded institutions at this point. Uh, as I mentioned, this is for undergraduates and master's degrees. By undergraduate, we do mean associates as well. So do not uh, plan on doctoral students as part of your target population for what you would teach over here. This is for early career stages. The third, and in some ways the most important one, is that we expect um, this particular funding announcement to specifically be reaching colleges or universities that have a historical or current mission to educate students from minority backgrounds. The way to think about this is go to your institution's website, read the mission statement, and see if the mission statement is written around students from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds. If that is just one of five or six things going on, you may not be eligible. I'm happy to clarify with you whether or not that would be the case, but really, ideally, your institution's mission statement makes it clear that it is the specific mission of your college or of your university to educate students from a population that by NSF criteria laid out on this slide have been defined as underrepresented in biological sciences. So I'm happy to help you get a yes, no determination to this, but really this is not for any and all applicants. This is for institutions that are particularly focusing on students that have been excluded up to this point from genomics and data science education. So let me also cover a couple of things that are important here. I've used the words educational content quite a bit. Uh, so I've gotten a few questions as to what we mean by content. Really, the definition is up to you. Educational content could mean classroom lectures with PowerPoint slides. It could mean uh, virtual learning where students are receiving genomics education in a Zoom setting, for example. It could also mean things that are videos. It could mean uh, hands-on cloud computing labs. We really want to hear from you what your ideas would be for how you would teach this. It does not have to be just classroom content or just uh, learning in a, in a, on a web server. This is really getting left to you to come up with new ideas for what uh, content would mean. Also, there is a list of things that would make something not responsive to this funding announcement. Uh, responsive is our term for what is um, what is considered in scope for, for the money being offered. There has to be a focus on computational topics, uh, computational genomics and data science. This is not for just teaching genomics unless there is a substantial focus on the bioinformatics or computational aspects of genomics. This has to be about the cloud. Uh, if you are teaching genomics and data science, but you have no plans for using the cloud as a tool, this uh, is not the funding opportunity to apply to. And there's a few other things there that are more or less uh, self-explanatory, but as always, I'm happy to answer questions. Remember, there has to be genomic data science and it has to use the cloud in terms of what you teach. 
Uh, as I mentioned, this is also going to give your students the chance to be funded for a research project. Uh, genomics and particularly data science are ideally learned by doing rather than learned uh, by receiving information in an instructor student setting. So we have these opportunity funds where as part of your application, you are invited to propose how you would organize your students into a group and do something like a summer project or a project as part of one of their courses where they collect the data. They design the experiment, they collect the data, and then that data comes back to the cloud and they learn how to use the cloud to analyze their own data. We believe that this is the best way to make them invested in genomics and, and sustain their interest in the long term. So quickly, let me cover how the application works. Uh, I very, very, very strongly recommend that uh, you schedule a quick chat with me so that we can go over your plans. I can hopefully give you something useful in terms of what would be considered responsive, uh, maybe exchange some ideas that have worked for similar applications before. Uh, NIH has the SF424 application guide, which is um, a huge, body of information of likely any question that you have the answer is somewhere in there sometimes it can be a little hard to find but that is the omnibus uh, list of instructions for how to apply to nih funding opportunities the main body of the application is called the research plan i'll talk about that in a minute uh, but please go ahead and first read the funding announcement from top to bottom uh, pretty much every part of it has some information that you will need uh, as you get into the application process. So let me first discuss the research plan. Uh, the biggest part of the research plan is called the research strategy. Uh, it has sections within it that I will cover. So first of all, we want to hear your idea. Like what are you thinking of when you want to teach genomics and data science to undergraduates or masters or associate students? Describe the overview of the courses and the content that you would like to develop. Discuss how you plan to use the cloud in that context. Uh, describe how you want to share things, assuming that NIH gives you the funds. Uh, how would you make things available to other institutions that are not uh, getting one of these awards? Uh, one big thing here is how you would apply to the hub for those uh, student research projects. So give us a plan for how you would organize your students and develop a research proposal that the hub uh, would then review and hand out those $50,000 awards for. And finally, these are three year awards. Uh, we would like to hear from you what you would do in year one, year two, year three. Give us something of a timeline for how this work would happen at your institution. Uh, there are a few parts of this that are mandatory inclusions. Uh, please remember to include a resource sharing plan. Uh, templates for this are available through NIH. Uh, as I mentioned, the plan for how you want to apply to the hub for those uh, student projects. These are separate pieces of the application. So each of these has a text allocated within the page limits. A dissemination plan. And then letters of support are institutional as well as personal. If you are uh, doing this with collaborators, you can get letters of support from them. But equally important, you need to include a letter of support from your department chair or from your dean of research that makes it clear that your institution is behind the work that you propose and will be supporting you in the administrative sense. So review is uh, interesting over here because uh, this is going to be reviewed not by CSR, the central NIH review office. These applications will get reviewed at the Genome Institute uh, in what we call a special emphasis panel. Uh, they will then go to NHGRI's council who can comment on the individual review uh, at, that was done by the special emphasis panel. And finally, program officers uh, like myself and Lucia together with colleagues will be able to make funding decisions based on a combination of your scores, how well what you propose um, aligns with what we would like to see happen through this funding opportunity. And also quite frankly, what NIH's budget looks like and how much money we have available uh, in future award years, so starting with next year. Uh, as I said, the deadlines are letter of intent, which is optional. You do not have to send us a letter of intent. You can just choose to go ahead and apply. 
But if you want to send us a letter of intent, the deadline is uh, the 8th of October. The application itself is uh, due a month after on the 8th of November. And my biggest single piece of advice is to not wait until that date. If you plan on applying, set yourself an internal deadline of at least a week before. Sometimes your college or university will have their own deadlines. But chances are high that if you wait till November 8 to start submitting this, uh, something goes wrong and that can lead to some pretty unfortunate circumstances. So once again, don't wait until the last minute. With that, I'm going to stop and take my slides off the screen and turn this over to Sarah. Sarah, I see a few things in the chat. What can I help answer? Thank you, Shoujo. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sarah. I'll be helping with the Q&A today. So we do have a few questions to start us off. With regards to the NIH cloud computing resources, what are the costs for those and can they be integrated with other platforms like XC, Jetstream, et cetera? Yes, so of, of course, uh, whatever costs you would incur for using the cloud are very much allowed to be made a part of the budget uh, in this application. I should say that we are actively looking into ways that can support your cloud costs. So and do include them in your budget. And if we end up having other money, then we might be able to pump those funds in and save you some of the budget uh, for this funding opportunity. But definitely this is designed so that you can be uh, you can be including cloud costs for educational purposes. Integrating with other platforms is of course something that I would love to see happen, but this is in many ways a reviewer question. Give us the proposal or give NIH the proposal. If the reviewers feel like that is a useful activity for the students uh, and ends up being something that NIH should be looking at in a bigger context, I feel that could go down very well. It is not a requirement from our end. We, we do not need anything other than using Anvil uh, the NCI cloud or the All of Us cloud, all we need from our end is a commitment to using one or more of the NIH clouds as they exist. If you want to in integrate them with other platforms, that could be an interesting idea, but that's a reviewer uh, decision as to whether they see it as being useful. And there's a follow-up regarding costs and if they're easy to calculate or if cost calculations um, might be a bit difficult. Yes, so cloud cost calculations, uh, you know, at best uh, inexact science at this point. I will, in a second, try to put a link, uh, or I will, we do have a cost calculator tool that we just built into the Anvil. So we are giving a resource to you to help get you at least a ballpark estimate of what it would need uh, in terms of the budget allocation. So Todd, send me an email or if I can, I will put it into the chat here. There's something that will at least help you get a head start on it. But we we understand that the number may be quite a bit different from what it actually ends up costing if your students get into it in a big way, for example. Okay, and next we have a question about designation as a Hispanic serving institution and if that serves as eligibility. It does, it would come along with those other two uh, criteria where are you a Hispanic serving institution and doing work at the undergraduate and master's levels and receiving less than $25 million of R01 funding per year. So it's a really good starting point, but it, it cannot be a Hispanic serving institution that already has many hundreds of millions of dollars of NIH funding which is uncommon, but just to make sure, make it clear that the eligibility are logical and operators that have to include all three of those conditions and not just the minority serving institution status. Great, and the next question asks if there will be additional submission dates recognizing that November 8th is pretty close. There is uh, at least one more submission date that is in June of next year. And it's too early for us to tell because uh, this is going to need more approvals on our side. But if the program itself turns out to be a success, then usually NIH or NHGRI try to keep things going, uh, of course, pending approval from our council and uh, senior leadership. But there's at least one more receipt date. So you're, you're all set, even if this November is too close for you. All right, and we also have a question asking if you're aware of NSF ATE, 
which stands for Advanced Technologi Technological Education. I was not, and I am curious about it. So if, uh, Todd, if you can put a link to that or send me an email with uh, where I can find it, that would be fabulous. All right, and our next question asks if there is a minimum number of courses that needs to be developed as part of the curriculum as recommended by NHGRI. No minimum. It's uh, completely your call to propose something. Once again, the reviewers, who in most cases are very experienced uh, professionals in their own right, will probably know how to tell the difference between something that is bare minimum in terms of the student offering versus something that is too ambitious. But we are not defining what a minimum number of courses would be as part of this. Hey, thank you. Looks like we're waiting for a few more questions to enter the chat. So please take your time and um, send in any other questions. Okay, we have a question. As a community college, it is difficult for us to create a new course. Can we modify existing courses to add the CGDS components? Yes, absolutely. The, remember, there needs to be a modification that would involve the cloud. We specifically wrote in, I forget the exact language, but uh, I'm happy to pull it out and put it in an email. There is absolutely no need to think of this as something where everything has to be developed from scratch. But if you modify an existing course, make sure that the modifications are in the general direction of adding computational genomics and data science. It could be either data science or it could be computational genomics or it could be both. But that's the general vector for how the modification would work. Or you could have a programming course and you could decide to add genomics to it. So you could decide to modify from either angle to make this fit what we are trying to fund. Uh, but the cloud is the biggest piece. If you modify an existing course to add a cloud computing component, I feel just my personal opinion is that the reviewers might be quite uh, positive about that. Great. Next, we have a question. Is there additional information on what specific assistance they can get from the hub? Maria, fabulous question. I think the first thing to do would be to read the funding announcement for the hub. Uh, it's of course a closed funding announcement uh, the application deadline closed long ago. But if you read that, you should be able to see what NIH asked from the hub applicants. The next thing to do would be to contact the hub awardee directly and explain what would help be helpful for you and see to what, to what extent they have existing resources or to what extent they have time and bandwidth to engage with you. This is a really deep question that will get answered in some ways by the hub and NIH together with you. I'm hoping that something or the other is valuable, but that might take a slightly different shape for every inquiry to the hub. In some cases, the hub may say, Sure, here's a web server that we built with uh, uh, easy to teach student exercise. In other cases, the hub may say, sure, we next semester, we can come do a two day workshop for your faculty on cloud computing. So it, it'll be, I'm hoping slightly different in each case. And of course, NIS has not given them infinite funds, but within the award that they have, I'm hoping that they will be able to work with you and others to design how to best help you, depending on what you need. Uh, Todd, thank you. NIH uh, and NHGRI really are getting into this in a big way. Between the Tide Office and OGDS, uh, expect to see a lot more from us in terms of education in genomics and data science. Next question is, what should be the likely duration of the research projects described? So a great question. These are... $50,000 awards, right? So we can't expect your students to spend a full year working for that uh, amount of money. Um, semester length would be my ballpark answer, but I, I do want to draw the distinction between my role as a program officer 
and the eventual reviewers of your application. So design something so that it is rational. And uh, you know, as I said, the reviewers usually have a pretty good idea of objective realities and what is a week would be too short, a year would be, maybe a year is too long or de depending on how you design it, it could be a small amount of work done over multiple years. This is really NIH should not be telling you how to design that research project. It's your idea to design and the reviewers who are not at NIH, uh, they make the call on whether they find the idea feasible or not. Okay, great. Just waiting for some more questions to come in. Okay, let's wait another minute or so. And as I mentioned, at any point between now and the submission deadline, I'm happy to get, if a shutdown happens, we may not be able to, but uh, let's be optimistic. And if a shutdown does not happen, then you should be very, very comfortable reaching out to me by email and we can set up a time to talk. Okay, if we don't see anything else in the next 30 seconds or so, thank you all for joining. I hope all of you decide to apply. Remember, if you apply to this round, you get a review score. And if the score is a little short of what would get funded, that gives you one more chance to revise and resubmit in uh, June of next year. So this is not a one and only chance uh, sort of funding opportunity. I encourage you to go ahead. And if you have not written an NIH application before, I should have mentioned this before, we designed this one so that it is as short and as simple as possible to write and submit. This is about the easiest design other than our 13s and uh, you know small $10,000 grants that would be too uh, not, not appropriate here. We really wrote this one so that it is the least possible burden on you to apply if you're a first time applicant. Okay, thank you everyone. You know where to find me and we will share the recording and these questions on the website.